So yeah, just a, a couple of brief words of sort of introduction to this part of, of the conference. Um, so as part of uh, celebrating Richard M. Frank's works, we uh, brought together this panel to discuss, assess, reflect um, on how he's impacted all of us. Um, so we have uh, sort of four questions we'll get through. Um, uh, some of this is we'll be asking sort of, you know, how did the rich and frank impact your own thinking on and scholarship, but also like also on a personal level as well. Um, we have questions about his contributions to the fields, um, some specific questions about Richard and Frank on Avicenna and Al-Ghazali. Um, and finally, we'll ask um, the additional question of now that we're here in 2023, um, are there ways that um, Richard and Frank's works um, shows some gaps or shortcomings or things that can be improved upon going forward. Yeah, and I'll turn over to Seal. Thank you, everyone. Um, today, our first question for the panel will be about Richard and Frank's influence on, on your thinking. And we would like to ask um, so, Richard and Frank was part of a generation of figures like Joseph Van Est, Ayam Gimer and Michael Mamora uh, that were expanding the field of Islamic uh, studies and um, and in influence and uh, form the way we think about Islamic intellectual history. We'd love to hear briefly how this work influenced your own understanding of Islamic philosophy and theology, uh, the work you do uh, and the methods you utilize, as well as how he personally impacted your own life and work. We'd be very glad to hear again, briefly, your personal experience with them, as well as how his thinking and writing influenced your own work in your respective fields. Is it, would you like to, would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I should begin by saying that Dick Funk was really fascinated by his own field. And to give you an example, after he had retired, and I knew him since many years, I would call his house. And then, of course, there was no cell phone. Jane, his wife, would pick up the phone and she would tell me, ah, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> and then say, you know, Dick is feeling a bit low. Take him out for lunch. He needs to spew all that Arabic. <laughs> so I would take Dick out. We would go for Maryland crab cake and a Pabst because for Dick, a lunch, we, a dry lunch was unthinkable. <laughs> And we would talk, and he was quite amazing because he could quote passages of Quran by heart. And therefore, he would go into all these. He had an incredible knowledge of Quran. I had not that level, far from it, but I could follow some of what he was saying. And I think that shows really that he was fascinated both by the Arabic language and by Kalam. It was really his own thing. In what concerned myself, I had the unusual experience at some stage to become Dick Frank spell check. <laughs> because <laughs> Dick Frank had an incredible knowledge of various languages. Just not the English one. So. But <laughs> his spelling was not the best. He realized I had been trained at some stage. He's a poor grad student to make money. Uh, he's a copy editor. So he was asking me to read his stuff in advance. So I would check the spelling, and also tell him is his sentences were clear because he had tendency to have a Ciceronian way of writing <laughs> 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 that could make reading him a bit difficult. So it was quite a fascinating experience. And I realized that oh, I had had some training in 
Kalam with Father Richard McCarthy, who edited Al Ashari Luma, a text of Bakilani, and things of that sort, that I had not paid enough attention to the way the words were used. In reading his famous Al Ghazali and the Asharite school, that the genius of Dick was to look at her. Razali was interpreting and seeing her. The words of <coughs> Ibn Sina could be used and used in a slightly different <coughs> meaning. So his remarkable attention to the text and to the terminology is something that really had a great impact on me. And he had the unusual capacity to a very high level philosophical understanding and also theological. So that explains why he could so well see in which way Nazali was really using Ibn Sina or taking distance discreetly from normal Ashari views. So I think it is love for reading carefully. <laughs> so um, the question just how did he influence your own life? And so I, I think in mine, it's like there's at least two stages that it happened. One, when I actually knew him, I was very early on in my graduate. Uh, I was still a graduate student when I first met him. I mentioned my story of my first encounter with him. Um, and then um, a second, in, after he had passed away, if you will, a second encounter with him, which um, influenced. So let me talk about the, the first one. As I said, I met him first at the American Oriental Society. Uh, so uh, yesterday when I was giving my talk, I and that was a... I also met David King, Paul Walker, and Sidney Griffith there, and I have stories about every single one of them. Um, so, um, but at that point, I, I just remember um, uh, Richard saying, you know, oh, there hasn't been any philosophy here. And so when he, I remember him sending me a, a text, he says, can, can we talk? And uh, so I did not a text, but it sent me a letter and um, he calls me and he says, are you going to the AOS this year? I said, I'm going to the AOS a year, this year. Yes. And he goes, okay, I am too. So there will be some philosophers there. I'll give a philosophy paper. Um, and so I, and this was actually, I thought it was the, I'm sweating like a pig uh, conference that I first met uh, um Frank, but it turns out we met before this, and this was at the uh, AOS in Portland. Portland. No, no, Toronto. no, 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 Toronto, Toronto. 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 That's Toronto. correct. Um, 2001. 2001. And my experience there was I got to hear um, Dick give a talk. I don't remember the talk at all, but do I remember the Q&A? The Q&A just was embedded in me, and there's like certain things that the way I translate terms now that came out of this Q and A. And so the question had come up, somebody was talking about the Arabic that, they were translating it as essence. And Frank was just, this is a wrong translation. What I proceeded, he proceeded to do is like, you know, it's how it's being used. He started with the Greek, the Heata, it's this reflexive. He begins talking about this, he then talks about how like sui or se in, in uh, Latin is used. He brings this all back into this, you know, un understanding of what essence is, how to understand that. And the next thing I know, it's not that he's doing just philology. He's saying, what is an essence? And he's pulling out all of this Thomas Aquinas. And what I'm seeing is a philologist and a philosopher really come together and in this one sort of question, and to this day, I, other than, and he had said, um, unless it's something like be high through, then you can do it as essentially, probably almost all translations should be self or entity or, and he goes, just, just try it. You'll find out that it works pretty well. And to this day, 
however many, you know, 22 years later, I have found that that actually, I mean, I translate, you look at mine, you'll never, you'll, you just won't see that translated as essential because it was just so, I was so impressed by this, but it was also all of a sudden I realized, you know, why are big isn't up to snuff if I'm not willing to talk about, you know, do it. And so that was part of what really pushed me even towards translating to improve, but it was just watching that there need not be a difference between how a philologist approaches these texts and how a philosopher approaches these texts. And so that was very formative for me in my early career. More recently, as I said, there was sort of two encounters with him. Um, was back in uh, beginning of 2019, um, myself and one of my colleagues were awarded a John Templeton um, grant in order to look at how um, medieval Islamic philosophy, theology, science actually could still be influential in issues in philosophy of religion today, particularly coming out of the, sorry, analytic tradition, but still um, it was, you know, how, you know, how is these historical texts, how can they still be made alive today in these contemporary discussions? And I thought I was going to be doing the science part. I was going to be good. This is what I've always done. And it became very clear nobody cared about the medieval science. They wanted to talk about the theology and the metaphysics. And I, you know, I've dabbled in this, but now I'm all of a sudden being forced to read Kalam thinkers in a way that I never had read before. I Avicenna, those in that particular tradition. And so I thought, okay, I, I need to get up to speed. And so what I did was. I went to that little article that um, Richard Frank wrote on Kazali and Avicenna, followed by a rereading of the cosmological system, um, and then uh, the Ghazali Asherite. And as I read these, Frank has, I mean, you might not uh, you know, agree with it, but he has this sort of thesis of a type of systematic ambiguity. And it goes back to a point that Therese was making that you can't just read these, if you just read them really quickly, it, it looks like he is very much just, you know, giving the creedal accounts, uh, the Asherite position. But then if you read it really closely, it's like, what has he actually said? I mean, uh, Ghazali is, he hasn't committed himself to anything here or, <laughs> oh, oh. And then you have to realize that like, um, Yesterday, I was talking about affinity um, at Tafak. Well, he was using this in the same way that Kazali, um, that uh, um, Avicenna was talking about imitations. Um, it was this very Aristotelian Avicenna view. And then once I knew, just begin looking at how is certain language changing? But is it the same concept? And that was very much. Um, due to Richard Frank. And then the other one was, anytime he says, I've gotten to a point here, oh, you know, I really, this is not suitable for a public audience, or you could only, Frank basically said, stop, go back, reread again. What has he been doing? Has he set up an Avicenna position? And when I took just this way of thinking about reading Ghazali, with next to Avicenna and how to do it and how to try to, you know, there was like, he really gave you certain sort of tricks for finding where the Avicenna is probably hiding in the text. And all of a sudden, Ghazali just, it's like, oh, this is not particularly totally new. I know some of what's going on. And then it becomes fun, like, so what is he like, but where is he actually differing? And so, and then you can see him sort of very systematically doing it. So for me, there were these two moments where I just, and um, Frank actually said, you just wait till you get philosophers up there, they can't shut up. So I will shut up with that. But that was these two elements that I had seen um, and they very much show the impression of this man, so. Um, I should say that in addition to Jan Thiele, Therese Andrew, or John McGinnis, and uh, Frank Griffo, I also have Toby Meyer. Um, Toby Meyer um, is a researcher at the Institute of Ismaili Studies in London, and also has some um, sort of comments as well. So Toby, you wanna um, jump in? Um, thanks, and thanks for a lovely, lovely conference. Um, so we're answering the first question. I, um, 
I guess I came to uh, to the study of Muslim intellectual history as a graduate, and I was aware from the get go of Richard Frank's reputation uh, as a Arabic philologist and as a scholar who really held to the idea that God is in the detail. Um, but the fact is that when I went on from an MPhil to do my doctorate, I, I sort of framed it very much in terms of the reception of Avicenna, which is, of course, a pretty broad topic. Um, and um, Ghazali is, this, is, is, is really the, 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 the form, the, the original crucible for that negotiation between Avicennism and Ashadism. Um, so yes, I turned to Richard Frank's work. This would have been in the 90s. So I did look at, um, at the article that John McGuinness has just mentioned, Al Ghazali's use of Avicenna's philosophy, which I think came about out about five years before Al Ghazali and the Asherite school. Um, yeah, and I, um, I sort of devoured Al Ghazali and the Asherite school because it was a rather troubling revelation. I had hitherto um, viewed Ghazali very much in terms of his standard sort of biography, which is partly built on his Monkiv, uh, so his self-presentation. I saw him as, as, a, as, a, as a paid up member of the Shafi Ashiri establishment who had a Sufi Toba in 1095. Um, but as I saw it uh, carried into his later Sufi texts, a good deal of Asherism. So this sort of, well, I don't want to simplify, but crypto Avicenna and Ghazali was challenging to me and fascinating. And clearly there was much to it, but um, I actually wrote a review of it for the Journal of Quranic Studies at SOAS shortly after it came out. And it has a an impudence, my review, which in retrospect surprises me. Um, I, I kind of, um, I mean, a lot of it is, it, it does focus on the iqtisad, and I was amazed that this um, self-proclaimed Ashari treatise was the text that Frank poured over to find traces of Avicennism. And I thought he was sometimes too swift to interpret it in that direction and away from prima facie Ashalism. Um, but I found it absolutely fascinating, a kind of detective story in a way. And I guess I was also very intrigued by his, if I remember correctly, um, key conceptual ideas to unlock uh, the, the the real Ghazali. One is that lovely phrase, a rhetoric of harmonization, which I think is very apposite. Uh, and in cases where, um, you know, Ghazali seems to be speaking completely univocally, either as an Asharite or I suppose in other texts as a as a as a philosopher. Frank introduces this two-level hermeneutic. So he talks about Ghazali's catechetical theology, i.e. Asharism, and his higher theology. So I found this a very interesting key to make sense of, uh, you know, a multifaceted intellectual of the stature of Ghazali. Um, I, heuristically, I prefer to approach Ghazali in so far as possible, as enshrining an ultimately coherent and unified system of ideas. And I think the key to that, which Frank goes, goes into, and the other Frank, Griffel, in Al-Ghazali's uh, Al philosophical theology, you know, it, it's that key idea of ijra'ul adat. I, I do think that's vital in, in reconciling Ashramite occasionalism and Avicenna natural causality. 
Um, I do think there's, there, there are texts which seem to me to, I hope I'm not going on too much and jumping the gun, um, but I've always been fascinated by that last section of Mishkat al-Anwar, the veil section. Um, as I say, I think there is a lot of Asharism in Ghazali's higher theology. In some senses, I would like to see it as a higher Asharism, actually. But when you read uh, a commentary on the Veils Hadith, uh, which is a veiled doxography uh, in Mishkat, and you can see where the Asharites are. They're at the bottom of the ranks of those veiled by veils of pure light because they affirm the divine attributes, but so in a de-anthropomorphic way, they have this positive theology. So they're there, but then you ascend the ranks of belief and you can see, oh, there's Aristotle, there's Farabi and Hafizana. I mean, it's all encrypted, but you can, you can read it. Um, and they are just before the Wasilun, the arrivers, who are the Sufi Orafa. So clearly, Ghazali does demote the Asherites very considerably and promotes the philosophers very considerably in that context. So anyway, I see Frank, Richard Frank is offering a, a fabulous, problematic in a way to struggle with. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, John? No, no, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we go by seniority. Oh, oh, yes, no, no, Frank, right? no, yeah, then, no. I think it makes sense. Yeah, no, no, it makes Please. sense. Yeah. I jumped the gun. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Please, this what we agreed upon, but yeah. I, 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 sh I, I should probably keep this short. Um, I, for me, Richard and Frank's creation and the creation and the cosmic system, which came out in 1992, was was kind of a way out of a crisis. Um, I was um, in the final stages of an MA program, but um, and and um, um, during the MA program, I had decided that I wanted to become or I wanted to, to uh, um, specialize in um, West African history. I wanted to write on the Tijaniya order uh, in West Africa, which at that point in time was a very remote subject. Nowadays, uh, African, West African Islam is, is, is much more in vogue than it was. Uh, this is a talk about 1993. And I was, but I had, for various reasons, I had a burnout syndrome or so. And then um, Germany still had military, mandatory military service, um, and they got me. <laughs> um, I didn't do military service, I did civil service. Um, um, we was given the choice there. Uh, and, um, and I was quite happy. I was at least content. I said, this, is, this might be okay that you take time, one and a half year off, you got, you got a salary, I had a I had a job. It wasn't very 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 onerous, um, and I lived. And the funny thing is, this was happening. Um, I, I had studied in Berlin at the Free University, which has a marvelous library resources. But that place was a small, relatively small German city, Hanover, which had no Orientalist library. That the university had never any done. It had, they had a technical university only. The whole city was, the, they couldn't get any Arabic books there or any, any literature about um, uh, Islamic studies. But Creation of the Cosmic System was published. And of course, they would not buy books in England or in Cairo or in America. But Creation of the Cosmic System was published in Germany by the Heidelberg uh, uh, Academy of Sciences. Um, and the local library, the, the, the academic library had subscribed to, the, to, to that series. So I found that I thought, hmm, this is interesting. Started reading, which was one of the few books at the city um, which kind of interested me. And I immediately got fast and I said, this is, this is something. And, and, and it changed my, my prospect from that moment on. I, I, I let West Africa be West Africa <laughs> and, and, and jumped on Al Ghazali. Um, I was fascinated by the way Richard and Frank kind of, it's almost, it seemed almost like a conspiracy theory. You would read the surface of Al Ghazali and you would get one impression. 
And then you would read Al-Ghazali the way Richard and Frank does, and he would say, he says the total opposite of what people actually think he's saying. So it was really uh, also, also a hermeneutic challenge there. And, and I found a very apt text, namely the Faisal Tafrika of Al-Ghazali, where I clearly saw very obvious influences from Avicenna because the, the, the distinction that he makes there, the different levels of, of existence, um, uh, that existence, hissy existence, all that mirrored the philosophical uh, division of the inner senses. So that was, a, and, and then I actually, I wrote in my master thesis on, on the Faisal at Tafrika, and that basically got me uh, on this track. So if it weren't for the sheer fact that, that creation of the cosmic system was published in the, by the Heidelberg Academy of, and it was really published there. This is what I later learned from, from Joseph Van Ness, because Richard and Frank couldn't publish it anywhere else. <laughs> it's such a technical book full with details that no American university publisher would have touched the book with a pole. This is, doesn't sell. Mm -hmm. And and it also, and, and of course, German, you would say vanity publishers, um, they had no problem, particularly not in this case, Josef Van Ness actually put it on the table of the Heidelberg Academy of Wissenschaft. Um, um, and then um, I, should, I should say, I was very, um, I had, uh, later on, I had contact with Richard and Frank. I, I actually, you know, uh, I think I sent him a letter. I might have called him. I don't know how. how I, we were then telephone contact on various occasions. I was still in Europe. And he even, for my dissertation, he sent me some films uh, that he had uh, of texts by Al Ansari uh, and, and, and Al Kia Al Harasi. Those were unedited at that point in time. Um, and I was living in London, and, that, and he, he sent me the films. I made a copy of the films. I sent it back to him. Uh, those are still quite important. And we phoned a couple of times, and I only met him once, namely at the AOS conference in, in Toronto, and only briefly, I should say. Although we had on various occasions, we talked on the phone, and I also sent him. Uh, some of my early publications in draft, which he then returned with a, like a peer review, and 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 a peer review can be harsh. <laughs> and that was hard. That was the harshest of the harsh peer review you would ever get. And you would actually say, you would you would you would get the letter, and he in four five pages, very handwritten notes, very detailed or typed up. I can't remember. Um, and you would actually say. This I have to actually, let's stay for a month and then I can read this again. And then I can take a look at the paper again. And of course it was a great improvement when you actually did this, but it was the kind of thing in this case, like, you know, Mushahada, you have, there is a haraka wrong in that, in that word. Apparently, you know nothing about Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suggest you go into, he wrote this at one point, I suggest you go into the beginner's classes of Dimitri Gutas again. <laughs> that was already when I was at Yale. <laughs> Quite hard to read those things. But like Toby, for me, um, and, and, and uh, the, the conflict between Richard and Frank and, and Michael Mamor was something that I found very productive. It was also extremely puzzling. Um, both of them, as I point out in my own report that I give in this case, both had totally divergent ideas of what Al-Ghazali was teaching. And both of them had proof texts, good proof texts. And apparently sometimes they even had the same proof text. Hmm. <laughs> so, so it was really puzzling. And it, I wouldn't say in this case that, that um, uh, Richard and Frank has actually carried the day. I don't think we have. We, come, we might come later to that, but it was really um, an, an irreconcilable conflict that, however, was academically extremely productive, and it, it taught my generation a lot, and I think that's also what told me. Yeah, um, well, I never personally met Richard Frank. Um, sort of, he passed away in 2009, I think, so I was just like in my first year of my, my PhD. So yeah, he, he belonged, I mean, if we speak sort of in terms of, as we Germans do in terms of family lineage, he belonged to the generation of my um, doctor grandfathers. Um, I got my comment, <laughs> <laughs> my comment about my insufficient Arabic from another member of that generation, from Josef Van Es, but no, from Richard Frank. 
um, but anyway, so I knew him basically by his 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 publications and his works, because um, when I got into sort of the second stage of what was at those time the uh, magister studies in Germany, I became interested in Islamic intellectual history. Attended classes on Islamic theology, and I think one of the first one was about like human free will theory and like throughout the history of Islamic theology. And I think we, I read at least three papers by Richard Frank just to prepare like the different classes. So one is, was on the chapter on Caspian and Luma, I think. The other on different interpretations of Khodra and Ali Kalam. And the next, the third one was, I think, about Akhtar Jabbar's theory of human rights. Mm -hmm. So, and then in my seminar about which I used to write, I realized that I even had a look at his beings and their attributes. So I was surprised that at this point, I was brave enough to open this book because this was another of these um, very technical books which was, was actually published by an American publisher by uh, Sunni Press. <laughs> I don't know when the policy changed, but at this point, apparently they were still willing to, to um, publish these books. Um, but let's say for me, this book being Sindra attributes were sort of the companion for many years to, because I got interested in, in Mortality theology and finally my MA work on a treatise on causality by a member of the Zaidi community from the 12th century. He belonged to the Bashami school of theology and then did my, my PhD on the entire theological literature written by this person, by this Arrasos. And he wrote also a, a comprehensive treatise on the theory of Ahwad. So for me, like reading um, beings and their attributes was sort of my, well, my key to understanding these texts. I don't know what I would have done without this book because I mean, I read it in different ways. So I used it in some way as a dictionary for Kalam terminology because it has this very useful index of technical terminology which then allows you to go to the text. And um, I mean, this book has also a very um, extensive uh, part of footnotes where he quotes extensively the, um, the Arabic definitions of the technical terminology and explains it over and over. And I think, I mean, his sort of, I don't know, this precision that you find there is to attempt to explain the terminology in the terms of the theologians was for me something where I really benefited from from which I learned so much and that really gave me an access to to